Welcome to Herp Talk Radio. I'm your host, Matthew, and my co-host is Peggy Detmer. Coming to you live from the Black Hills. It's Herp Talk Radio. Well, I think we should introduce one another so people get to know us before we have everyone get to know our guests. Right on. Well, uh, Peggy, uh, where? let's start with you then. Where, where does your love of reptiles come from? Uh, well, I grew up quite the tomboy with nothing but brothers and boy cousins and we were always down by the river seeing what we could find and and uh, I was collecting frogs and snakes and turtles and tadpoles and about everything else <laughs> had lots of tanks and jars in my room and and uh, I, I then gradually moved to turtles by themselves and uh, they've just kept me interested um, my entire life Awesome. What are you? Uh, what are you currently doing with turtles over there then? Well, I've got several as pets, and then uh, one day, one fateful day, um, Joel and I were out photographing. I had dropped him off at one part of the lake, and he was really interested in getting the eagles and the ospreys. And I thought I had seen a, a dead turtle beside the road, so I went back to investigate, and sure enough. Um, it was a dead female and eggs were spilling out and and I collected the eggs that were unbroken and found uh, I thought well you know they've been on this black top it's July who knows if they'll hatch I hatched them out and lo and behold um, 50 percent of the 10 intact eggs were clown um, the hypo melanistic um, color variation which I it wowed me. I never had seen one personally. And the other five in the clutch were normal phenotype colored painted turtles. And all of a sudden, besides just having two tanks of pet turtles, I wanted to look into what did I have here? <laughs> so I started contacting the broader turtle world, went from pet to, okay, I, I want to investigate this. Um, and so I started calling breeders and showing pictures, and all of a sudden I was starting to get offers for the the clown that did survive. The sad part of the clutch was um, four of the eggs didn't hatch, and when I egg top seed them, they were all the clown phenotype that were um, just, just did not survive uh, uh, development. And I was told by a lot of these breeders that were educating me on this gene that in a lot of the species where clown shows up, um, sometimes the clowns can be genetically weak. So one of them was strong enough to survive hatching and, and really was a great eater from the start. And, and this all happened in the summer of 2019. And so I've really delved into, you know, the, the breeding aspects of what breeders are doing with the uh, hypomelanistic, what the breeders call the clown um, or pastel uh, gene. Uh, and that's what really is, I, I, so I went from four pet turtles <laughs> to now, um, you know, uh, I've got, well, seven that are in my permanent care, but then in rescuing this um, road uh, catch, um, they uh, are people in the community are bringing me other turtles that or their eggs that they've rescued off the road for me to hatch grow out and it I didn't want to overstock myself with turtles so I called game and fish and said said as long as I keep raise these turtles keep them quarantined can I let them go where the dead mother or mother's were found and they they go oh we love this let's do a story on this let us know when they're ready to be released and we'll be out there with video and crew and and so I okay <laughs> <laughs> so from one road rescue to then this year there's um, been two and so I've got a tub full of babies um, all western painted turtles the uh, Chris Sunny's Picta belly eye and um, and so that's where I'm going with this. But uh, it, it's really a learning road for me, um, going just from having fun decorating aquariums and having a couple of turtles in this tank and then having another couple of turtles in the other tank to 
now I'm a rescue and uh, a breeder trying to prove out genetics and <laughs> and calling and, and networking with turtle breeders from uh, around the world now through Instagram. Are, are there any other uh, morphs or color mutations in painted turtles? Um, I just found out that besides this hypomelanistic um, trait, there is also what's called a reticulated trait. And it's they're saying they're normally or usually finding this in the male Western, or I should say the Western painted, uh, excuse me, the male painted turtles of all the four subspecies of painted turtles. And they tend to have this really intricate um, map-like melanism um, uh, crossing over the, the normal yellow and orange mapping that you'll find on the top of their carapace. And, and so I, I really, for the last few days, been exploring that to see what this looked like. Did I have any turtles unknowing to me that had this trait? And lo and behold, two of the babies that I am raising, although I incubated for all female, they are, they, they're having some really interesting, I've never seen before mapping on their carapace that um, if they come out to be reticulated females, well, there's going to be a lot of other interest in what's going on. So yeah, that... I'm, I've contacted several universities to find out, you know, once I've heard that they have uncoded the, um, the Western painted turtle genetics, I'm contacting them to see if they know the exact gene location on what chromosome is determining these color differences. That's and awesome. so far, they said they haven't really concentrated on the color genetics just yet. That would probably be in the wildlife department. Most of the Western painted genetics are being studied by um, biology departments to study the cryogenic possibilities of what's going on with painted turtles that they can withstand, um, uh, you know, freezing temperatures that don't rupture their cells as, you know, and, and apply that to, you know, human health concerns. So we're still kind of out in the cold right now as breeders, as far as, you know, the, the exact chromosome gene sites of what's going on in the turtle world. Yeah. It's it's not quite as uh, contested or researched as the ball python market is. <laughs> yeah, I I understand that um, from what I hear about what's going on there, people can really, I mean, they've really got the genetic code figured out um, a lot more than the turtle world. Although the red ear slider breeders are sure coming up with <laughs> a lot of um, uh, different uh, outcroppings away from the wild colored uh, phenotype. And so I'm, I'm excited to get one of those breeders in our one of our future shows that will really educate us on what they're finding uh, what they're, and what they're all breeding in that red ear slider uh, community. Yeah, that would be that will be interesting. So you're breeding the clowns, and uh, what's what are you? Uh, what's your plan on how you're breeding those? What what's your setup um, like? Well, yeah, it's uh, since out of that clutch, I ended up with five healthy males. I incubated at eighty four, so I had a, a mixed sex clutch at eighty two Fahrenheit and lower you'll end up with mostly males. Uh, what kind of substrate did you use? Sorry. Oh, um, I used um, the vermiculite and a perlite mix okay. that uh, it's called um, hatch right. Yeah. And it really worked good. It, it kept the humidity at the right uh, consistency at around 80, you know, 75 to 80. And, uh, and, and yeah, it, it, they all, the ones that were viable, um, hatched in a normal period. But what's really odd with that clown clutch, the, the five healthy males um, hatched at a normal time. And then I could tell that um, four of the eggs had, had died, the embryos quit developing, but the one 
kept developing, but more slowly. And then two weeks after the five had hatched, out came the clown. And that's when I was surprised. And, and a lot of breeders are saying the clowns take longer to develop. And it could be that what, what I learned in genetics, sometimes if you have genes switched off that are color genes, the genes beside them can also be switched off that are very important biochemical pathways that are then inhibited. And, and so with some of these folks saying that the clowns sometimes don't survive hatching, or in the case of the clown that I have, it took her longer to develop. And she is showing, um, she's not had a tail drop. Um, she's showing to be male, or excuse me, to, to be female so far. Um, but they're also saying that it, it took their males clowns, they thought they had a female. And then once it reached four to five inches, all of a sudden it dropped its tail, it, it grew its nails, and lo and behold, it's a male. But it just took three years more <laughs> to develop the male characteristics than its um, normal colored um, clutch mates. So it's, uh, uh, it's really interesting. Um, most of the breeders I'm talking with about this clown gene, they're mostly eastern painted turtle breeders. And there seems to be a lot of them produced each year. Uh, no one has um, produced this western painted uh, morph uh, at, at the coloration that is exhibited in, in the clown that I have. And so I, I turn down offers for this turtle, um, usually on a monthly basis. <laughs> um, at first, once I put it out there, like, what do I have here? This is what came out of this road rescue. Oh, my gosh. I had, you know, a representative who was representing someone in China, you know, offering money for this turtle. And, you know, a, you know, you know North American breeders, South American breeders. And I said, she's not for sale. I'm a retired scientist. I want to know what I have here. I'm too curious. I want to breed this, <laughs> you know. Right. And so it's um, it's been a, a fun journey. Yeah, I bet. I genetics are so cool. I'm very interested to see how that pans out. Um, mm -hmm. That's one thing that really, really interests me in in reptiles overall yeah i'm i'm right now i i did buy a really colorful female from the turtle source in florida she's a, a really very light colored green um, her skin is lighter um, her markings are very unique and i thought you know if i'm going to introduce um, an, another western painted into this line you know i already have the the full brother to this clown is sexually mature and they made it and produced offspring. And then if I take those offspring, which may contain this clown gene, um, and breed it, uh, and I incubate it for females, and then breed these females back to their sire, I could get this gene to pop up while I'm waiting for my clown, which is growing slower than any of its siblings. Um, once it matures, uh, whether to male or female, <laughs> I have yet to know so far. You know, I'll just say, you know, she stays a female and I'll breed her to her brother. Um, and then I'm there, I'm much more apt to get um, some clown showing up in, in the clutches of sister to brother, one being, um, you know, the, the phenotype of clown and breeding to a possible heterozygous clown, but showing wild type. And when you breed a full clown, if it has the same genetics that we're seeing out there, it's basically a homozygous recessive. And then you breed that to a heterozygous recessive, 50% of the clutch should come out to be clown, just like you know what I experienced with this clutch. But uh, since the mother that I found um, was a, 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 a wild-type coloration, she produced 50% um, clown clutch. That means that there's a clown male in that water body that I found her near. So I have permission. I talked to Game and Fish about this. Since I've 
now become such a volunteer in rescuing these turtles and then also volunteering to move turtles within Custer State Park from one drying pond to a more permanent water body. They said I can place um, turtle traps out there and then um, as I census um, the turtles that I'm catching in the, the water bodies in Custer State Park, I'll photograph, I'll record, I'll measure, I'll release. If I do come across a clown, I have, they've granted me a scientific collector's permit that I could keep this clown and then, and then see if that clown will produce more clowns. Um, and so that I'm really excited to find out. Um, so, uh, as I sit there and, and wait for those basking turtle traps to fill up, I'll be doing some plein air painting on the, <laughs> on, on the shore. Cause also as an artist, I enjoy oil painting besides sculpting. And so I'll, I'll be hitting two birds with one stone. <laughs> Maybe we should hit on that a little bit of, uh, uh, what, what, what you do. You're a artist and a sculptor outside yes, of reptiles um, so <laughs> yeah uh, and and I, I can't believe i haven't sculpted a turtle yet but i do have um i wanted i want to do a basking turtle in what they call the superman pose you know just really enjoying that sunlight with its legs all extended its head up in the air and in that and that that constant Western painted turtle smile <laughs> on its face and have it up on a really nice um chunk of wood and, and I'll, I'll sculpt the turtle out of wax and then I'll mold the wax and the, the wood together and have that as a tabletop sculpture. Um, so that I'm, I'm looking forward to doing uh, when I can get back out in my studio in the summer. It's a little hard right now to keep the studio um, warm at this time of year. But uh, then uh, with the oil paintings, I do uh, mostly wildlife and, and some landscape, but uh, I had been juried into the International Wildlife Art Shows as a painter and a sculptor. Back in the 80s and 90s, I, I showed with the best wildlife sculptors in the world, John Siri Lester, Robert Bateman, Nancy Glazier. I mean, you, you know, the, the list of who's who in wildlife art, um, after only having been sculpting for two, uh, three years it was. So I was, boy, and, and if you were juried into the shows, you could also take the seminars from these famous, famous, famous artists. And so I, I, I've learned more in one seminar with John, uh, or excuse me, with Robert Bateman than uh, I think uh, a whole four year college education could have given me in, in painting <laughs> wildlife. <Yep. laughs> I mean, what he is just a phenomenal instructor. Uh, you know, how to capture the characteristic of the pose, the majesty, um, what poses you photograph that you just throw away. <laughs> because like we were talking, Joel and I today about, um, you don't want to paint a flagpole eagle. You know, it looks like, you know, there's an eagle sitting in a tree. You know, you want him, is he about to take flight? Is he, is he calling to eagles across the valley? Is he flying in a, a very wonderful pose that has a lot of vertical appeal on the canvas. I mean, there's so much into painting, um, the cool and warm light, you know, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was all wrapped up in, in that seminar. It was just wonderful. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah. you are a conservation biologist by degree too, as well, right? Yes, yeah. yes. I, I graduated from SDSU at Brookings with um, two bachelors of science, one in wildlife and fisheries sciences, um, and then the other in general biology. Uh, un under the general biology is where I really studied um, semesters of uh, genetics and, um, and molecular biochemistry and you know the really, really um, deep understanding of what goes on in biology to the multicellular and even, you know, uh, viral <laughs> um, level. You know, we studied all sorts of things like how to properly make vaccines, how to properly take vaccines. Um, you know, all that came in handy so much, you know, especially with this pandemic. Um, I had 
uh, medical doctors calling me to um, jump in on some uh, Zoom calls and Facebook um, chat rooms to uh, help educate their nursing staffs on the difference between this COVID aerosol spread virus versus a droplet spread virus. And, you know, so it was really interesting to find out that we wildlife biologists learned more in virology and epidemiology than nurses do, uh, unless the nurse is being specifically trained to work in epidemiology wings of hospitals and such. And so it was um, a lot of hands on deck <laughs> during, during this pandemic. And, and I, I forever thank Dr. Chen, who taught molecular and cellular biochemistry at SDSU, because uh, boy, that, that certainly helped <laughs> to know, um, you know, what to do in, in this aerosol spread uh, uh, pandemic. Well, and, so and, and and I bet that goes into yeah. quarantining all the all the live animals that you are getting or recovering from so the Custer State Park. Oh yes, and yes, and I, quarantine pleuric practices and and all of that. And that's all very important, especially oh yes, especially very in a much conservation so. setup. Yeah, just recently um, I took in an infected box turtle, who had a specific bacterium that destroyed his eyes. And he's, he, we, we pulled him through, but he will be blind for the rest of his life. And he, but he's, he, he's quite the trooper. He marches around the house and he investigates the dogs and he's, he's quite happy, you know, and so he's got a small little, uh, tortoise house and, and then, and then, uh, I, I see, when did I got him in late September? And then, so I've already started building a habitat for him that we'll move him out to in, in the spring. It's a small one, so he'll, he'll become quite familiar with it, you know, being blind. He'll, he'll know where his water is and his hut is and that sort of thing. And then um, got, and he had to, of course, be very quarantined. And I had to wash up uh, each time, you know, I handled him as if I was going into surgery. And the same way with this huge painted turtle we found earlier in the summer, that had both a fungal and bacterial shell rot that I took to Dr. Stone Cipher in Rapid City. He also works with Reptile Gardens. So um, he, uh, I never had seen anything like that in any of the turtles I had ever kept. And so I, uh, I meant to just help her across the road. And then I, I, I said, oh, let me look at her before I just let her down on the other side of the road. And she had, you know, the holes in her plaster and that were almost even past the bone. I went, whoa, I'm taking her to the vet. So I did. And he goes, oh yeah, um, we'll culture this. We'll see what we're fighting. But you know, he, he gave me the, the right salve and, and ointments to put on her. And so I treated her for two weeks and, and the discoloration left. And in, and within the third week, I was already seeing the keratin starting to um, grow or the bone started first and then the keratin started replacing that bone or covering that bone in just three weeks and so then he said uh, yeah she's you know pretty fit to release but now she's got eggs inside her <laughs> and so um, uh, and this is at the head of the treatment that we found that she had eggs inside her and so he said I want to pop her with oxytocin and then have you um, uh, incubate the eggs and you know because she's you know you know we're handling her she's a wild turtle she may not feel comfortable to get rid of these eggs we don't want her to become egg bound and so <laughs> so all of a sudden I had 11 eggs to incubate <laughs> like ah and so yeah they're so I, I just I kept those babies separate from the ones that I breed out of my clown clutch of course and and they are the ones that will be re-released you know, this, um, you know, once it warms up enough and the babies will be energetic and, and, and I usually release them at, at the side of this lake where there's a lot of cattails and they usually feed them, you know, on the, the plant matter and the insects that are all surrounding those cattails. And they've got a lot of cover and, uh, we're also are going to provide more basking sites for them because, um, there's, uh, 
you know, with all the floods and the droughts, they're at the, the levels of the ponds and lakes fluctuate so much that uh, at this one lake, I've noticed that there just are not enough basking sites, and the competition for those basking sites are dire, which means then the turtles there are not getting the basking time that they need to properly digest their foods and right, right. and and for and form their eggs and and so it's it's um, <laughs> the biologists that work for the park and with our fisheries our South Dakota Game Fish and Parks Fisheries Department goes and you're just doing this as a volunteer. <laughs> I go, well, I'm retired. I I need a hobby. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, yeah, it's it's exciting. Uh, You know, rescuing turtles out of a drying pond at 101 degrees out there, though, that was not fun, but... um, uh, When when you play with life, you play with death sometimes, too, right? So... Yeah, yeah, and... Uh, and I, I thought one of the, the days it was going to be my death. It was so hot out there. Uh, and I thought after that experience, I thought I'm not coming out in the, in the, in when it's this hot out without someone else there. Cause it was kind of, a, an isolated pond and I could have come into some trouble with the heat yeah, and me being six, yeah, me being 65, I, um, if I also fainted from the heat and, uh, yeah, then what would have happened? <laughs> right. so, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> oh, so why, why did you want to join me on this podcast journey? Oh, when, when you called and, and, uh, when I, when I, I think I first saw that you were looking for someone to join in on this and what I have found is, um, in the podcasts that I enjoy, watching uh, from turtle breeders and turtle rescuers and um, from around the world. It, I learned so much. And I think with each guest that we bring on, I'm going to learn loads. And, and, and I used, uh, when I used to work for Custer State Park and other uh, at national monuments and, and parks, um, I was also called a, an interpretive ranger, which means you help the people of the parks understand um, everything they want to ask questions of the park. And for me, of course, they put me on the wildlife aspect, like how do we set game limits? How do we manage the Buffalo and Custer State Park? You know, all, all those sort of um, questions. I enjoyed talking with the park visitors and, and, and mingling with them. And I just felt that this, since I'm retired from that, I, I was really missing the communication of what's going on. And, and I never really got, this is um, into the reptile world um, as a biologist because we were always working on big game species or upland game birds or migratory waterfowl. You know, I never got into the reptile world as much. So this is, you know, I'm heading into a new world. <laughs> Heck yeah, there's so much to learn out there. Yeah. There is. I've got a lot to learn about turtles. That's that's where I'm going to struggle on your end, <laughs> is the keeping up with the turtles. Uh, <laughs> well, now I'm going to learn a lot about snakes and lizards from you, because I've, I've kept snakes when I was a tom, you know, a young tomboy. You know, I always had to have a snake or two and and uh, but mom said no more snakes when they had, one of them got away and ended up in the bathtub with her one, oh, man. <laughs> one night all of a sudden I heard screaming and I, I was looking for my big garter snake and couldn't find it couldn't find it and all of a sudden I heard screaming coming from the bathroom and <laughs> my snake found my mother in the tub <laughs> and joined her <laughs> and that kind of put an end to my snake keeping for a while <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome uh what 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 do you want to achieve then you said learning and you've you covered a little bit of a little bit of the that end but what what else would you like to get out of the podcast oh it's um i guess sharing information you know as i learn from my networking with breeders worldwide um i've become now a member of the Turtle Survival Alliance, the TSA. It's a worldwide organization that goes into um, convincing people like me who have a knowledge of turtle keeping to help uh, start assurance colonies of 
um, threatened or endangered species because they can't seem to be able to keep a steady population in the wild because the they're poached at such a heavy level that they just can't keep a viable breeding population. So right now, a lot of the species, the only viable breeding populations are at zoos and at these private keepers um, compounds that are breeding terrapins and tortoises and, um, you know, about every aquatic and land dwelling species out there. And I was shocked to find, you know, in this new exploration of mine that the Western painted turtle, you wouldn't think, is becoming rare and threatened in certain areas, especially up in the provinces in Canada. And I think it's going to start happening here for as many of the ponds that I had seen drying up just here in the Black Hills and how many turtles were moving to find water and were killed on the roads. And that's exactly how it's been happening up in Canada. Um, there, the, the, the amount of droughts that were more frequently having now are um, drying up a lot of what's called the prairie potholes. And uh, so a lot of these ponds and marshes are drying up and and I think, lo and behold, one of the most common species in North America is now actually becoming rare and threatened, um, you know, here uh, in our, you know, uh, in our state. I think it's going to happen shortly if, you know, these ponds keep drying up and, and they're being drained too, which... Um, we're trying to stop that from happening. Um, and, and then there's, you also said that there's a uh, red-eared sliders out there too. So, and those are non-native oh, species. Oh yes. So that's that's another. They're fighting for resources. You know. Yes. Yeah. Red-eared sliders can get 16 inches long, and the standard Western painted, it's usually about uh, at full maturity, um, you know, nine to ten inches, and so they outcompete. Um, they 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 lay much larger clutches. They they are bullies when basking, um, and so they they, they out compete in basking sites. They outbreed the western painted turtle, and I saw uh, 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 Joel's father. Uh, Joel is my partner, and and uh, his father is like Joel is quite the wildlife photographer, and he captured a picture of a red ear slider at Canyon Lake. I saw when I was walking my dogs at the little pond in Hill City near their information center, a red ear slider there. And so it was one of the things that they granted uh, me my um, scientific collector's permit was to, you know, if I see a red ear slider to put, put that basking trap out there and try to catch it. And then if I can't find someone who would want to take it on as a pet or, you know, put it in their backyard pond that it couldn't escape their yard, um, you know, then we either have to euthanize it according to Game and Fish or, you know, there, I know, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it, but it's, you know, we know we have to get rid of that invasive species. And, you know, it was photographed in April and I don't know if anyone would, re would release a turtle that early in the season so it, it may have overwintered even though it's a southern species yeah it may have overwintered here in the black hills which is really concerning that it can survive i'll be excited to hear if you catch any in your turtle traps this this coming season yeah yeah it, it'll be fun because you know i'm sure i'll catch our native species along with you know, any invasives and the natives, I just photograph them from the top and bottom. I measure them. I check to see, uh, you know, I palpate their flank to see if they are, you know, carrying eggs. And of course, you know, you're not going to be able to count them, but you can pound to see, uh, palpate them to see if they're gravid and then release them. And, and so it's, it's kind of a, a fun little census that we can do. It's, um, it's not going to be extensive because, you know, I am a, a sculptor and right now I'm bidding a project that will be taking up a lot of my time, you know, in the, I'll be renting a garage, a warm garage <laughs> from um, one of my neighbors who helped me uh, sculpt another, or I was uh, sculpted one of my other larger projects in their garage. 
And so it's uh, someone wants um, a large white buffalo in bronze from me. And, and so uh, I'll be doing the clay work. Um, you know, that's really an extensive time. But I'll still have time for the podcast. That's, that's good. <laughs> My hands need a rest. <laughs> yeah. And and so that'll be fun with uh, with that project. Uh, that'll that'll allow me to buy a number of tur- turtle traps and maybe even hire uh, an assistant <laughs> to, that would to help helpful. me go around to rescue and and to. Uh, yeah, I talked to my accountant and I said, I think I might have to turn this into a 501c3 so I can hire an assistant to go out there with me when it's really, really hot because I don't dare do that by myself again. Yeah, that no, was... I, I wouldn't. I bet, you, I bet you if you asked, I would come because uh, I, I want to go herping this this summer. So that oh, sounds, excellent. That sounds really fun. We, sh- we, yeah. should, we should try to maybe do something like that this summer go herping and oh for sure then you are you are on the top of my list if if we have a a local guest who wants to come along and enjoy that too that would be fun get a couple couple of people and go see what we can find i'd like to find like some red-bellied snakes black hills red-bellied snakes those would be cool you know our milk the milk snakes here look really cool too and i've never caught one of those so that would be oh yeah It would be and, super yeah, fun we to found... go out and try to try to catch stuff while we're catching turtles and traps. <laughs> yeah. And and we saw um, a king snake that's not supposed to be here. Um, in um, we took pictures of it. It was sadly uh, run over in one of the roads in Wind Cave. We took pictures of it and reported it to the National Herpetology, you know, report, and you know, took its GPS of where precisely we found it so uh, you know all those kind of things that we do and we don't intend to be out herping but we come across them yeah no like that's that's you got to be out there to find them yeah that's that's the key yeah so when do we get to start talking about you Matthew? well uh (laughs) let's let's get on the podcast first uh what what as a whole what do you what do we think the mission is you know like uh i uh I do want to achieve more of a, a learning environment and have that uh that that long term mm-hmm. it's it's always there if you need that information and mm-hmm. and that's that's kind of what I want to provide um all sorts of information okay. uh from beginner stuff to all the way up to all the genetics on your clown projects which uh half of uh, mm-hmm. the audience probably won't even be able to understand you know uh <laughs> once you get dive deep into that you know how mm-hmm. at some point you start losing you know so i want i want to get get deep like that as well as well as include mm-hmm. beginners and and be open to to the to the new keeper cuz i don't think there's mm-hmm. too much in the podcast variety that that wants to try to cater to them because it is about it is about those deep dives but at the same time, yeah. we, we gotta. I, I want to find a way to include that new audience and the new people coming in. You know, mm-hmm. I want. I want. That's that's very important. Yeah, I, I agree. It's um, you know, I just know that. I think the more people learn and appreciate reptiles, the more help those reptiles will get at a time when we really, really need to be concerned about their populations um, and make it a fun thing. Like I am having fun rescuing and documenting turtles. Yeah. And that's what it yeah. is. It's, it should be yeah. fun. It's a, it's a hobby that that's meant to be enjoyed. And if you're not having fun with it, then you probably mm-hmm. shouldn't be in it. And so. that is what I, yeah. And, and, and I think the, you know, I, I think our podcast can really reach people that like, well, gee, I, I want to hop in, you know, on, on your rescues. And, and I want to, you know, it'll just be um, more of a chance to network with like-minded folk. Right. <laughs> that, that is that is exactly, that is one big reason why I want to do this, too. It's the networking, the, the talking, uh, you know, it's like an outlet. Mm-hmm. You, can, you can come in here once a week, which our show will be once a week uh mm-hmm. and and check it out and learn something new yeah and um 
you know, people, you know, they'll have ways of contacting us like, oh, you know, I just found one. How do I house this? And, you know, what do you do for that? And what's the best um, tank heater you've found for your aquariums that the turtles don't break? And, you, right. know, you know, all sorts of things like that that we can answer for folk. And, um, and we can learn, too, that, well, maybe there is a, you know, a better light that gives me both UVA and UVB and... You know, I mean, I just learned one of the particulars of why you want UVA as much as you want UVB. You know, it's, and most reptile keepers right now think they only need the UVB. Um, but I learned from a breeder, oh no, you, you know, to get the proper shedding, you need both. And, and it's true. Um, since I've really, and he recommended a particular bulb. And ever since then, I've, you know, I'm, I'm getting rid of that retained scoot problem of, you know, that turtles usually get if, you know, you winter them indoors and um, just had a wonderful shed off my southern painted turtle that I've had for years. And I think I've, she shed off three years of retained scoots last night. Oh, and hell. yeah, I mean, so it's these kind of things that networking just helps us all solve issues that no matter how much we research and we go to the companies themselves, are the companies telling us, you know, everything we need to know? Are they being biased on their products? You know, it's, you know, it just helps us solve issues, yeah, you know, at, even hopefully before we have them. <laughs> at the end of the day, it's just trying to better the, the keeping for the animals in captivity mm -hmm. while also trying, to, you know, going down that conservation road as well of, those people and that that helps too because we're we're trying to bring animals in from outside and keep them inside and nothing can mimic mm -hmm. the sun you know that, yes. there's no light that you, humans can make at this point in time anyway that can mimic the sun so right. it's it's real and we're we're it's all just a guessing game and no one's gonna it, there's never gonna be a hundred percent right way because again up here in south dakota where we're at we it's yeah. dry you know yeah we, it, we uh -huh. versus if you go down to tennessee or something it's it's a totally different environment and you're gonna have to do a totally different way of keeping but mm -hmm. it it's all all that information is relative because instead of talking specifics with with animals we were to, we're talking gradients we're talking mm -hmm. you know like yeah. this is an ideal area but it might not work because you might be too dry and you know yeah so. yeah and then how do you create a a more human environment you know for your animals and mm -hmm. and um you know i follow um one podcast and uh, and youtube channel he's all about um he started making habitats just for himself um serpa design and all of a sudden zoos and and rescues and uh, you know these you know have him come in and make habitats for them and regardless of where they live you know, and, you know, I learned so much and enjoy, you know, he's made outdoor ponds. He makes indoor, pal you know, uh, you know, aquariums, terrariums. Yeah. I'm really and, into and, him, too. He's, uh, yeah, he does a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm oh. anxious to see his new reptile room in the new house they moved to. Right, it's right. like, boy. <laughs> I'm I'm subbed and waiting. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> Every time it comes out, I got notifications <laughs> on for him. You're a hundred percent. Oh, right. Yeah. And that he, he he's an artiste he, when it comes to he really habitats. Is. I he mean, really it's just is. yeah, yeah. It's it's fun, and hopefully we could get him on the podcast and you know and that on would be really cool. How he, you know, how he started and yeah, it's it's fun. Um, well, yeah, I'm just yeah when when uh when should uh people tune into the show wednesdays probably i think yeah, is what we decided a, on right for now yeah a nice midweek break yeah you know, it, and that way we're not going to interrupt their weekends when they should be you know um enjoying their reptiles right <laughs> or you know let's or see helping why you're us cleaning rescue. your reptiles <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah Heck yeah yeah i um and uh and where are they all going to find it where it's going to be we're going to be on youtube uh patreon if you want to support the show you can go to patreon.com and support the show for as little as one dollar a month 
all that all that helps produce this and make our quality even better uh also any podcast app apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify all of them will have our show excellent that'll be fun right on that's that's the show Ah, uh, yeah. it's my turn. <laughs> yes, I need to hear about your life. Like, when and how did you get started with reptiles? Well, when I was a kid, I had a I had a best friend who whose aunt had like a garter snake den in her backyard, so we'd always go Ooh. over to her house and catch garter snakes, and and that that sort of thing. Well, my friend passed away when we were ten, actually, so. Mm. So I've kind of just kept on keeping on with that. He would have, oh man, this dude would have crocodiles in his house if he was alive, I swear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I would too if I had enough space. But, um, you know, it started there and then uh, that happened and I kind of got out of herping a little bit because that, that'll kill a vibe. And, um, oh. you know... Uh, I always wanted a snake after that. My mom always kept saying, no, 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 no. So she said, <laughs> when you're 18, actually, uh, mm. she, she forgot the words move out, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for Christmas, I got her a Kenyan sand boa one year. Um, oh. Yeah, she wasn't too thrilled about her new snake. <laughs> Um, but I was, and, uh, I had that snake for a very, very long time. And then some life stuff happened. I acquired more snakes and, uh, lizards in that time. I've had walma pythons, uh, leopard geckos, bull snakes, um, ball pythons, corn snakes. Uh, I bred the leopard geckos. I had success with them one year. Uh, mm. and I just realized lizards aren't, aren't quite for me. I don't like bugs. So oh. <laughs> that's, yeah, I don't like bugs. So I oh. tend to stay away from lizards now. Um, <laughs> then I had some life stuff happen and got out of the hobby for about three, four years. And now I'm just starting mm -hmm. back up. Uh, I've got I've got a couple of bull snakes now and a couple of bull pythons. And then a eastern yellow-bellied racer. Oh. Yeah. So now, are, so, are you finding um, that you have a limit to your reptile keeping? I mean, do you, do you have, is it going to be determined by your time or your space? At, at this point in time, it's my space availability. Um, mm -hmm. I do breed rodents, too, and I'm working on maybe trying to start uh, selling those in the local area. So mm -hmm. I, do have, I do have baby rats right now. And I'm mm -hmm. very excited about that. But I, I have enough time on my hands for more. Uh, mm -hmm. I just don't have space. It's more more got kids and other stuff going on. Yeah, that, that would if be I, a biggie. <laughs> if, I had a, if I had a room that I could keep everything in, it'd be a little different. I'd probably have a lot more, but I do not have a, a room. I've got <laughs> little nooks and crannies here and there to place stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, your kids are going to enjoy growing up with, you know, dad that lets them play with all those animals. <laughs> oh, man, my house is a zoo, and I love it. I love it. I need more. <laughs> yeah, well, like like my dad said is, hey, as long as she's into all these animals, there's going to be less time for beer and boys. So. <laughs> right, right. They're, yeah. If you got obligations. You got obligations, <laughs> yeah. so... <laughs> yeah yeah so um well that's really cool so what are your breeding plans you know for the future oh uh, i'm still kind of working on that i really want to get these uh this eastern yellow-bellied racer to start eating and and get going here uh because mm -hmm. man i don't know if you've ever seen them but they are just a gorgeous snake they almost look venomous they've got just massive oh. scales for in comparison in comparison to their size like they are uh -huh. just a huge like, gorgeous green bright yellow belly i mean it's a beautiful snake the the issue is is, mm -hmm. is getting it to eat at this point it, uh, the guy mm -hmm. i got it from said it was eating frogs uh 
I couldn't find mm-hmm. frog legs at Walmart. Um, still, still got some ideas. He also said they'll eat snakes, mm-hmm. so I have snake shed that oh. I'm gonna try wrapping a okay. pinky in. But it, uh, mm-hmm. it's also cold, and it's winter time in South Dakota, so yeah, I think it's it might be mm-hmm. shut down for the winter. And no, oh. you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know where that snake's going. Uh, the ball pythons <laughs> breeding project is is uh isn't going to be anything too major. I want to get into some Kenyan sand boas. There isn't any mm-hmm. Kenyan sand boa breeder in the area. There's people doing mm-hmm. ball pythons around. There's people doing hog snake, hog nose snakes. You know, uh, mm-hmm. just not not Kenyan sand boas, and I, I think they're great for someone who doesn't ever want to see their reptile. Uh, like <laughs> I got it for my mom because it would it would hide in the sand and you'd never see it. So that's oh, wow. the point, right? Like if you don't if if you need a secretive snake <laughs> that you're never gonna see, oh. it'll just be burrowed mm-hmm. in the ground and you'll never know where it's at. Which is oh, nice. which is a nice thing at some points in time, you know. Huh. I, I I prefer the ones that really curl around and, and just like to investigate their habitat and, and that know, that's where I'm at. That's why this uh eastern this this racer that I have is my favorite snake at this point in time that I have because it's always out and exploring and and it's always mm-hmm. moving when when mm-hmm. it's warm anyway. Uh like yeah. it's very <laughs> it's very active in the daytime and that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So, Have you had any snakes get out of their enclosures yeah, and join and you in the, in the bed in the them. winter? <laughs> no, not in my bed. I've never found them again, though. I I, oh. I have. <laughs> I have never found them again. And this oh. is, and I'm sure other other people who have had like baby corn snakes or baby hognose snakes that are smaller than a pencil, like mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't. I did not know what I was getting into. When I got got uh, that baby hognose snake in size, because that thing got out and it never came, it never came back. Oh. I could not find it anywhere. Uh, mm-hmm. They, I mean, snakes are escape artists, so. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then when they're yeah, when they're smaller than a pencil, it's. I was really worried about the bull snakes. Actually, the container that I have the bull snakes in is like one of those sterilite, little itty bitty. Uh, locking tubs that are just oh, little yeah. small and short because i didn't want them to uh-huh. get out because they're little itty bitty things so uh-huh. I, I was very cautious with those little snakes scare me actually oh because <laughs> they can yeah, get out well... <laughs> if it's big and strong yeah, the... you just need a strong enclosure if it's small you need to cover every little hole and <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah I, I i once I once carried in a, a a shirt load of baby snakes into the house because they, yeah, um, and and then my mom asked me what I had in that shirt and she pulled the shirt open and baby snakes went everywhere and we kept finding them for months. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a story yeah. like that because well, oh man, my mom would have lost it. <laughs> I was scared my of my mom. mom. <laughs> Too scared. I never heard my mom scream like that before. <laughs> oh. Oh, That's yeah. how she, I, I <laughs> bet she would have screamed about the same. It's comparable to opening a snake for Christmas. <laughs> well, you know, I, I told her, you know, she wouldn't have to worry about mice for a while. <laughs> right. No. And that's, that's a good point. You don't have to worry about mice around your house if you find a snake around it. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, she just hated when the snakes would end up in bed. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's you know that's warming not up okay. next to them. <laughs> <laughs> that's not yeah. okay. I don't know about that. Yeah, well, the one thing I love about snakes, and and Joel and I have rewilded our yard, and um, and now we have less mice coming into the house than our two cats prevented, um, and and uh, also what a neighbor just two doors down had reported to us was that the um, chipmunks were chewing up their vehicle wires and so you know me being a biologist I had to look up like why are these these rodents chewing up vehicle wires so this wasn't the first time I heard about this and found out that our soils here in the Black Hills are copper deficient and so um, I I told her you know to get a cat or you know you know rewild the yard and, and have some 
you know, how to increase their snake population, which you, they weren't willing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Not many but, people are. <laughs> yeah, the cats are great in the winter because the snakes aren't helping you out too much that, there. But, you know, when you have a good snake habitat, they will eat up the mice in the in their nests before right. they get large enough to cause, you know, such a problem. And, and so far, knock on wood, Joel and I haven't had you know, rodents eating up our vehicle wires and then having to have our vehicles towed into town and, and all this electrical fix. It's like, oh my gosh, what a nightmare they went through. And um, uh, I don't know, that's, you know, that's when we really decided we want snakes. <laughs> <laughs> right. And lots of them. <laughs> and if they're outside snakes, you don't even have to take care of them. Yeah, and right. that's the, you know, you just encounter them while you're out there gardening, and, and then you get to pick up the babies and, and handle them and then let them on their way. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I had just asked you about, um, were you thinking about, you know, having uh, an acreage to accomplish your breeding plans or... Uh, I, I, I at least want like a, like a big outbuilding. Um, I, the, the acreage wouldn't necessarily have to be there in order for that mm -hmm. to happen. You can, you can put, so, you can keep a lot of animals in a, in a good sized outbuilding. And that would be with complete, um, uh, heating and insulation. And yeah. Such? Yeah. Full climate control. Probably so, like the, 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 the good concept would be like full climate control in multiple rooms oh, so you could have wonderful. so you could have a hot room a humid room a cool room you know hmm. then you now, could keep multiple it, it, species together because it's it's hard to keep a amazon rainbow right next to a, a desert species you desert know tortoise. yeah <laughs> they don't share the same environment at all yeah, and, now, and you in, really in the, you really need like a, a room to accomplish an environment. Now, how how do people? I've never really kept human spe humid uh, terrestrial species. Um, uh, I, I don't know if in in just in our small little house and with my tanks and tubs with the turtles, um, we use a dehumidifier to make sure we don't have mold issues. How do you control something like that with humid terrestrial species. So at, or... at this point in time, Mike, I, I don't have any issues with mold in the tanks. I'm using like a, uh, I'm using cypress mulch in the tanks and then I have very good ventilation. I think ventilation oh, okay. is kind of a key to, a key to keeping things. Um, mm -hmm. So I raise the humidity up, but it's not super high because, and then, then I keep a humid hide with like my ball pythons. So they have somewhere they can okay. go where it gets more humid. Okay. But I haven't had any issues with mold or anything in my in my snake cages. Oh, that's that's great. I know I when I do my turtle tank cleaning every three to four weeks, um, then I I wipe down and check for any molds that are forming underneath the lips of the aquariums and you know any place that you know that it could be happening and. I'm sure if That's I kept I like do. a like a water species of snake, a semi-aquatic snake, I'd be more concerned with that, with the having mm -hmm. water around. Okay. And so your breeding plans are to do the outbuilding. Is that where you're living now? Or no, no, we're on... not there yet. Uh, my breeding plans okay. in the in the next probably well, I don't know if we'll be breeding snakes this year, but by next year we should be. This not next mm -hmm. breeding season, but the following twenty twenty four. Um, all oh, my okay. baby snakes will be old enough to maybe try for something. Um, I'm still okay. in the process of acquiring what I want. <clears throat> like I said, I want to maybe get some Kenyan samboas and go down that road, mm -hmm. just because uh, locally mm -hmm. breeding that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to try to help supply the Black Hills with pets instead of PetSmart and Petco. That's a uh, it's kind of important <laughs> to me. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm kind of, I also like super hard things to do, like, like that racer that I have and, uh -huh. you know, fighting that battle. So I don't, I don't know exactly what's going to 
happen, but I'm sure mm-hmm. through the podcast and talking to people, I'm going to be acquiring things as we now, go. Do you hope to? Yeah. Okay. And do you hope to have your breeding plans become an occupation or mostly breeding, uh, hobby breeding mm-hmm. and with, um, you know, a, a small income from the breeding? I'm looking for a, like that. I, I just want to breed for fun at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Now rodents on the other hand, I think I think I want to make that one a business. Um oh, okay. So I, I do like the rodents. I don't know why I like mm-hmm. the rodents so much, but <laughs> I love rodent breeding. Yeah. It I'm so happy I got these babies. I can't mm-hmm. wait until they get big enough to feed to the ball pythons because that's why I got them. I just figured out my bull mm-hmm. snakes can eat their pinkies so I don't even need these mice that I have. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so oh, if the okay. mice produce, then those will just probably go, uh, up for sale as frozen and, oh, okay. uh, anyone could get a hold of them. Oh yeah. I know. I, I feed pinkies to the box turtles and, and then, you know, also to my larger painted turtles. So yeah, there you go. You've got a customer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and there is no rodent breeder in the black in, in rapid. So wow. that I know of anyway. Wow. So Mm-hmm. it's a there's a there's a gap in the market that needs to be filled well, and if that could eventually help you know mm-hmm. i don't want to get rich but if it could help you know pay my rent mm-hmm. i'm not going to complain <laughs> yeah 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 i i it's really interesting you know to hear the degrees that we can choose of the levels of breeding complexity that we want to get into <laughs> right I, I yeah the snakes is, is uh, it's a fun fun thing for me i'm i'm mm-hmm. really the ball pythons i kind of want to line breed a little bit which no one in ball mm-hmm. pythons is doing and kind of make ours look different than everybody else's even though they're the same thing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that'll take a lot of time but that's that's kind of mm-hmm. something i want to do is work on you know certain looks Certain, so you, are you certain... hoping to create create a new morph? No, no, not at all. Mm-hmm. Just oh, just okay. refine what's there. I don't think any refinement has been made in ball pythons. There's a couple of ball python breeders who do like very much care about what they're doing, but for the most part, I feel like it's just let me put this morph with that morph and make it happen, and then I'll get mm-hmm. this, and then I can sell that for this. And it's not like oh, but this is the best example. You know, okay. it's, it's not about the best example. It's just about producing. Okay. And, and, and when you say best example of this snake, the brightest, talking, it's con- the, the okay. brightest in the clutch or, you know what I mean? Like if you're going for mm-hmm. no alien eyes on a ball python, well, mm-hmm. then you don't want to breed ones with alien eyes, you know? Okay. So that line breeding, that forming Mm-hmm. That's that. That's kind of what I want to do. Oh, in the in the ball pythons, but, I don't want to get it too deep into that. I'm I'm more interested in doing like carpets and and other species as well. Mm-hmm. So, hmm. yeah. See, I and alien eyes. I don't even know what that means. No, the pattern <laughs> on the side of the ball python. It's an alien head. Okay. And then it's got two eyes in the middle, so you could remove. And I've, there's breeders who have removed those from normal ball pythons just by breeding it out. Oh. So you mm-hmm. can change the pattern and color of a snake just by line breeding it. You don't need morphs, oh, okay. which is oh, really, gotcha. really interesting. Interesting. Well, I'm going to learn a lot about snakes from you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just getting to know this whole turtle breeding thing, you know, like, you know, and it's... There's so much that I don't know. You know, there's the, the different types of clown morphs in within red ear sliders. It's like, well, I thought there just was a clown morph, but there's, you know, there's just so much to learn there. The the different types of patterns of the clown, um, you know, and so. Right, and then you yeah, could I mean, take just, you could take just looking at all the clutch paints, you could take the brighter one or one with a little bit darker lines and you could take that and refine it over generations and generations and you eventually produce something that looks absolutely nothing like what you started with. 
that is what excites me yes so you can um, you can line breed those to have dark black lines if you really try you know so mm -hmm. yeah hmm. there's a snake so breeder that... there's a snake breeder that took black and yellow carpet pythons and turned them to white and yellow and right. it took him for 15 years to do it but he did it so wow <laughs> wow now he's got his own line yeah. they're not a morph it's a line it was line bred it was all yeah wow interesting yeah because i i'm just picturing some of these um clown ridder sliders that some ha on their carapace looks like they have their they have peacock markings you know these mm -hmm. circular peacock markings that are just with these bold oranges and yellows and blacks and and then others that are more I guess they call them reticulated where it's all these fine lines of bright oranges and yellows and contrasting with some browns and blacks. And, and I, I'm just amazed when you, you see them, it's like, here's the normal red ear slider and here's something that doesn't even look like a red ear slider anymore. It's just the, the color pattern is just, I mean, there's not a, even any stripes in the skins. There's um, more like, um, uh, bold patches that are reds and oranges. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. Like the green is gone. It's just, um, and I, awesome. I know when I, yeah, I, I, I'd love to see, you know, when I, when I do Google, I, I, you know, like I put in morph, um, clown turtle up comes a bunch of morph or clown snakes. And then I just, I get lost in, in looking at all those wild colors. And yeah. it's like, I wonder which snake is deemed more, yeah. most desired. You know, I don't know anything of, of uh, that. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't understand how that works either. <laughs> do, you, do you just go to like maybe a market and then you well, find there's, out? Well, there's a place called Morph Market, which you can get on. And they sell like all, every breeder of everything, turtles, lizards. Mm -hmm importers mm -hmm. they're all on there mm -hmm. so you can mm -hmm. you can see what's for sale but mm -hmm. it's what's hot and new and that changes year to year and and that changes mm -hmm. with like what's hot on youtube what are the youtube people doing you know so mm -hmm. once once or like one girl posts in one picture on instagram about on her white lip python and now white lip pythons are are eight hundred dollars? Oh wow! No one wanted them, but now, now you can't even find them. So wow! And and how many people is it? Is there a a census of here's the amount of people who are ball python owners and breeders? I mean, is there such a census like that? <laughs> I I don't know. I think that that's just the biggest area at this point. Like the mo hmm. most most snakes that are produced are ball pythons. Uh, okay. I think we're starting to go back to corn snakes. Mm -hmm. Like it, the shift is going back to corn snakes, but corn snakes were cool in the '90s, and then they lost they lost it because of the ball python craze. And now I think corn snakes are kind of coming back a little bit. Well, they sure are easier to keep. They're you know. They're so less picky smaller. eaters, from what I understand. <laughs> They're about the same length. Yeah. One's just fatter. Oh, okay. And one's more active during the day. One's nocturnal. Mm -hmm. One's a pet rock. One's not. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's. Huh. And so you're going to stay with the balls and, and, uh, and instead of. I the, have the, the balls corns. for the kids. <laughs> And uh -huh. I have pitch, I have I have Pitcherophis, bull snakes. So mm -hmm. I have thought about venturing into corn snakes. I just don't know what I'd want to do. And I've tried corn snakes before, but it was mm -hmm. that baby never wanted to eat. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. It was hard, and I don't want to go through that. And I haven't had any yeah. issues with ball pythons, but I, ball pythons can be picky eaters too. Maybe I just got a bad corn snake. Mm. You know, no. Like, when you're when when your snakes don't eat do you um what we do with turtles is like okay i'm i'm bumping the his water temperature up to 86 and boy within you know 
uh, usually about two or three days. They're, they are eating like piranhas. Yeah, I've, um, wh- I've heard of bumping up heat. And then a lot of times it's more food item related. Because like, mm-hmm. like Terry at Reptile Gardens, his approach to keeping, especially in Reptile Gardens, is everything is 80 degrees. That's mm-hmm. it. That's what they get. They get 80 degrees mm-hmm. ambient temperature. Mm-hmm. And that's that's how it is so when you when you look at that's how you can keep that way you know Mm -hmm. does it come down to a food item with the snake or is it the time of year or a storm coming in or you know there's so there's so many other factors that you can't control now do they get a basking um site that is warmer some and then uh well i uh, how i keep i have a I have uh, like a rack set up in my closet. So I have, Mm -hmm. it's hotter at the back, warmer or cooler at the front. And, Mm -hmm. and I keep it about, oh, in the daytime. Now it's probably hitting 79 up there, ambient on the cool side. So the warm side's sitting at 85 to 90. Okay. And that's kind of what I'm keeping at. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, boy. (laughs) <laughs> I guess I, you know, just, you know, the recently having, you know, the, the turtles in aquariums where it looks like I have this beautiful little pond that I can just gaze at and, <laughs> and watch them frolic in the tank. And, and then I hear you keeping them in trays in the closet. <laughs> I'm like, but That's but, the only but... space I have right now. <laughs> and I do, and I do yeah. have my, my racers in a, in an out, in my living room and in a bigger setup and viewable, mm-hmm. but Bill snakes are babies and they don't need a hiss at everything that walks by the ball python, <laughs> the ball pythons are babies and they don't need to be stressed out by everyone walking by and in the living room got mm-hmm. three kids in the house so you know oh yeah like <laughs> gotta uh-huh. gotta mind what species i keep too because it's not like i could get a get a boa or anything that's big because i don't have the space to house something like that right now Mm -hmm. Hmm. interesting so uh so your future look ahead um uh you're you're saying you're a year out to really want to get into i'm a year out from producing anything okay okay just because i don't have old enough animals and i don't know even if i went and bought like a an old enough animal now if it would produce next season you know this coming fall mm-hmm. i don't know if it would because they they're animals they need a year to adjust most of the time you know mm-hmm. and then when you buy an adult animal maybe that breeder's getting rid of it because it won't breed so ah. then you know you're just stuck with something you don't know <laughs> ah, interesting <laughs> you know yeah. you don't know why that guy's selling his why why would you be selling your adult female? Mm-hmm. <laughs> now now are there breeders that have, you know, five star breeders that you can trust that, you know, they they say this, you know, this female has produced X, Y, and Z and and you know, uh, you know, you, you know you're getting a producing female? I think I think there's people you can trust, but that's all on your own accord. Like you gotta mm-hmm. you gotta do your research. You know, most breeders are small time people like just have one room in their house dedicated to whatever they're doing, you know, Mm -hmm. so it's not like it's it's not like you're going to a big facility like bar check or anything Mm -hmm. would be something smaller. I see. So it's more of that like small community type deal, you know. Gotcha. Yeah, I I think... um... I, I know the turtle people are that way too. It seems, um, you know, they they really want to acquire the best breeding stock, and and once they get this much more bolder female, they'll sell their female that they that had been their best, and you know, and and I just know that with my morph clown, it'll be another year or two before she's big enough to to lay eggs. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, oh, 
come on, what, what, what magic growth formula can I put you on that you will grow as good as your brother does? <laughs> well, and then you if know? you would have got her, like, I know you couldn't have got her from a facility like that, but by that mm. time, what did that, that turtle go through at that place? You know what I mean? You don't know a hundred percent and who knows that guy mm-hmm. could have been having a bad year and uh, his turtle stuff keeping could have suffered just a little bit. You know, you don't, you don't know what people are going through. If uh, that, if yeah. that's the case anyway, you know, mm-hmm. that yeah, happens sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I know that, um, you know, where I, I, I bought my, my aquarium turtles instead of fish i i wanted a little pond and i bought my aquarium turtles from the turtle source and from florida and every um i bought four turtles from them and as fresh hatchlings and well they were well started they didn't have an egg tooth and they arrived with a very very hearty appetite and completely healthy and i've never had a problem with them and and you got them as hatchlings and Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. not like proven females that they've been, you know. Correct. I don't know that you know you might yeah. move that female and she may never breed again. <laughs> yeah, you she know, might and, just and... decide that you know I had my home and I'm I'm not going to breed anymore. Wow, I, I see, and I I'm I'm not not heard of a turtle ever doing that, and huh. and I've never heard a breeder tell me that a turtle has done that they go oh they'll form eggs whether they've made it or not and you you just have to oh have a so they're place. like lizards yeah you'll have to have a place where they're comfortable laying or if she'll be get egg bound and then you know then it's costly and all this sort of stuff so um oh man i've uh, i didn't i didn't realize they're like they're like lizards they kind of have to breed yeah yeah they um they so uh you know, I, I figure that uh, with the paintings, once they get to about four and a half to five inches, they're going to start forming eggs, and you might as well have them bred. Um, and uh, you know, if you know you've got some breeding goals in mind, otherwise you just, if she's never been with a female or with a male, then you just throw out the eggs because you know they're infertile. But you have to get have her comfortable to lay. Otherwise, it's a trip to the vet and oxytocin and x-ray to make sure you know the number of eggs that need to come out of her and, and you count to make sure they've all come out. And if they don't, then, you know, it's you try again with the oxy. If that doesn't work, then it's a, uh, a surgery and, a, and you're through the plastron. And, you know, you're talking, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of money. The and whole so I, I yeah, so I tell people if if you don't have the money to really keep turtles as if you're taking care of your favorite pet dog, only get males. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so don't start with a hatchling that you don't know what it's going to turn out to be. Get a a turtle that is either male or female. At about three inches, you'll know. And and for people who like I, I one of the turtles I bought from the turtle source, he's a, a small little midland. And he's only grown to three inches and he just refuses to grow, you know, even though these others that are younger than him and they, I feed him the same foods, he's just a runt. And look, people would love to have a turtle that isn't going to get bigger than three inches. Right. And I have, I have but no But you don't want to breed breeding. that. You don't want that in right. breeding stock. We have a runt rat and I want to keep it, but do I really want that in my breeding stock? Or is it just right. not getting? Or is it just not getting fed? You know, we, you don't know. It, is it genetic, mm-hmm. or is it is it just not getting food? Right, and and that's why I I separated him to make sure that he was getting enough, and and I I don't have any intention of breeding him. Um, he he just is one of my decorative aquarium turtles, <laughs> <laughs> you know, who uh, you know, and and so I I was contacted by a gal who is given me um uh, rescues uh one that had um i was getting metabolic bone disease because he was only being fed uh what was it lucky charms and so i pulled him through and he he, his shell wasn't too distorted and now i've had him for three years and his shell looks normal um but uh you know it's um and i don't plan to breed him 
either. I only have the one breeding male I care to allow near females, and that's the possible head clown. Right. You want to carry that gene you know, on. And... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's the, the – so anyway, the, the gal that gave these two rescues – to me it's um she has a guy like she's never had turtles before and she'd like a turtle and i go oh have her call me (laughs) because before i'll give a turtle to somebody who's never had a turtle before i want to talk to them about the expense and you know how often that water should be changed how much filtration that it needs so that you know you have a, a beautiful tank that never has any odor to it you know and and it's entirely possible you know and but, you know, I, I, I want people to get into the hobby, but I don't want them to be disappointed, you know, um, you know, that they need to have UVB, UVB and UVA meters so that the turtle isn't going to get bone disease and all this sort of thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, that's what I like about this podcast. You know, people can tune in and say, well, yeah, I can do that. I, I can have a pet turtle, it, you know, if I just do X, Y and Z and. You know, and if they if they require a trip to the vet, you know, I, I think I can handle that. Uh, you know, I just don't want people to acquire turtles and then them, you know, having keeping them with tropical fish and then they get tropical fish diseases that you can't tell if they have or if they're, if they're carrying dropsy. They, you know, I don't want them to let this turtle go, even if it's an, a Western painted. Yeah, in, but it in, could, in the park. That'd be right, bad. and then carry... Yeah, and carry tropical diseases to our our native turtles. It's like no, <laughs> that that's a big no. And um, yeah, so I I just that's what I'm looking forward to with this podcast. It's just the do's and don'ts that can easily be followed, um, you know, for the the betterment of you know uh, our wild reptile communities as as well as the fun networking and you know having an enjoyable hobby i'm excited to uh, learn a lot more because i i while i love turtles and my only sculpture was when i was six and it was a turtle mm-hmm. um oh. <laughs> uh, what did you what materials I don't know did you use anything about turtles uh it was like red oh. clay in in art class when i was a kid oh neat it cool. broke but (laughs) that's okay so i yeah i and i know nothing about keeping turtles just because i didn't want to get into the aquatic part but Mm -hmm. then then i kind of want to get into some aquatic snakes you know so Mm. or semi-aquatic snakes i don't want like a elephant trunk snake or anything but Mm -hmm. you know like Mm. a brazilian rainbow boa or a yellow anaconda or i don't want greens way Mm -hmm. too big but you know something Mm -hmm. something that goes in the water Mm. (laughs) yeah well that would be our local um garter snakes boy on one of our favorite ponds that sadly dried up um and that joel and i had rescued all the turtles out of um there were snakes galore always at that pond swimming in it catching the tadpoles and and you know i if I had more room, I would have included one of those snakes in with our turtles, um, you know, um, but they, you know, it, it's almost as if those snakes uh, in, in that uh, little pond system, they were 50-50 of, of the time they were spending in the water and then up on the land. It was really, it, it was almost as if they were adapting so much more to the aquatic um, environment for what you know, you constantly saw them feeding on. It was so fun to watch them as much as the turtles. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are super cool. I've thought about getting a, well, my bull snakes are a, a mud butte or from mud butte anyway. So they're going to be a mud hmm. butte locality thing that I project that I want to work on. So I've thought about picking mm-hmm. up some garter snakes from around here too mm-hmm. and doing a local uh, locality breeding of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and well, you well, once the season warms up, you're going to have to help me census the snakes in our yard because uh, um, we I came across a snake 
so the red line snaked from um, Colorado. I'm like, what are you doing here? And before <laughs> I could catch it, it was off. And, Holy cow. And, uh, oh, man, if you've never seen one of those in the wild, it's like, that is not a garter snake. I mean, it is brilliant, brilliant red. And, um, it, it, yeah, it's just... I, I had to run inside and, and get on the internet and, and put, uh, and I, I had just put in there red and black line snake and, and it came up with red line snake and where it was native to, and it wasn't supposed to be native to up here. Um, it's uh, a Colorado, uh, I think was the northern most, or I'll have to double check again, but it's like, oh, you know, when, when you're, when you're out planting a tree, you don't have a camera with you, right? <laughs> right and so i i didn't get a shot of it and and i you know but um you know so we do have the the plains garter snake here in our yard we have the common garter snake and we have the reticulated garter snake and i was and we've had the green racers we've had um we did have the red bellies here and they seem to have dis- disappeared and i think they eat that, so if you lost a slug population or a snail population that would be why ah okay yeah we because i really have... wanted to try to get those into captivity and mm-hmm. and have a breeding project of those just in case something happens to where they're you know no one's breeding them um mm-hmm. and i i think i'd have to breed slugs and i don't know if i i want to uh... do that um mm-hmm. there is a guy on the east coast i think he's breeding slugs in order to in order to do them. And I wonder if you saw a red-sided garter snake, because we do have those here in South Dakota. I, I will. I'll have to do and some And some of them Google. can be super bright red in color, like like neon red. Well, that would describe this. Um, I went to the South Dakota reptiles page, and it was not there. And what it looked like the most and and it stayed there on the rock sunning and i so i was like i don't have a camera with me i have to capture this with my eyes because by the time i go in the house and grab a camera come back he's probably going to be gone and so i just really made note of it with my artist photographic mind and so that, then when i ran inside and grabbed the camera sure enough i go out there and he's not there anymore but um and so then i i googled based off my memory and yeah but, the, the, the red-sided garter snake looks really close to the eastern or the plains garter snake except mm-hmm. for it's bright red on the sides so no it, it, isn't that the the, the red um uh, kind of reticulated in with the black line or not that might that might be the red sided that you're talking yeah. about then there yeah yeah um, cuz we have I the know. wandering the plains and and the red sided, I think. And the common. Yeah, which would be the plains garter snake. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. Well, I, I know we had uh, one that has a lot of red reticulated in with the black line. And then, um, and that's usually the, the line, you know, it goes yellow, then black, and then reticulated red and black, you know, and then the belly. And we have that one as well as the the yellow and orange and black and black and then the reticulated that which is mostly you know the grays and then that one <laughs> <laughs> that was just there was no yellow on it at all it was just all red and black <laughs> and that's why i found it so unusual but yeah you'll um I'll have to have a, a net with me when I'm out there <laughs> uh, you know, working with the trees and the fruit trees and the, the bushes and all that fun stuff. But yeah, that's a, a, a lot of fun. I, I, I'm excited that we may be able to get a lot more um, herping days because of this podcast. You yeah. Know, we get that's... some club members together and go out herping and rescuing and, Heck yeah, and stuff. we'll have to do something for the patron, the patron, the patrons, patrons, oh, uh, I think the Patreon, so. the Patreon, Patreon people, pa- <laughs> <laughs> the Patreon patrons, yes, the patrons yeah, the- over on Patreon, <laughs> they uh, will have to do something super special 
for that yeah. group. Yeah, uh, I, you know, like the yeah activity rewards. Yeah, that'd yeah. be fun. We're gonna have to and figure after... something out. We got to get our tears done. That's not even done yet. Holy cow! Oh, boy, we have a lot <laughs> to talk about there. Well, because... and subscription levels and what comes with those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I've got a lot of prints. I I did a drawing of a when I lived in Tucson for three years. A, a drawing of a desert tortoise. Um, I was um, I qualified to be um, a foster for the displaced desert tortoises due to uh, developments. And um, I got down on my belly and took pictures of Toby and oh, he was big. He was a good size, like at least 15 inches long and quite the tame turtle. Um, he'd knock on my back door and I'd let him in and he'd walk to my refrigerator and pound on my refrigerator with his shell. And I kept his, um, prickly pear fruits in there and I'd have to walk him back outside because he'd get all purple <laughs> and I didn't want that on my cream colored carpet <laughs> but uh so I've got the print of him you know, that I did in pencil and you know that could be one level you know a, a, a print of Toby and uh you know we could do t-shirts and we could do trips and and what I'm envisioning for a, a you know a a herping day and and with a, a fun dinner at the game lodge you know that would be Ooh, that would be wonderful fun. yeah that's what i would I, I do for my art clients is we take them on a photo wildlife safari through custer state park and wind cave national park and then we end up at the game lodge and have wonderful dinner out on the veranda at the game lodge <laughs> we could just make a herping trip out of it and call oh, it something yeah. different that sounds really fun <laughs> yeah. actually yeah it it is um you know i uh, one thing through the gallery in hill city we meet international travelers and so they really enjoy you know seeing the black hills from you know because uh, we take them from the creeks up in the mountains down into the savannah and then down into the prairie you know by the time you go through the middle of custer state park mm -hmm. down through the back roads in um, Wind Cave National Park, where we find a lot of reptiles. Um, so for our herp, herping folk, you know, I've got all kinds of turtle ponds and snake places we can go to. I haven't found any, you know, I, I guess Joel and his mom had seen a lot of the horned lizard, you Ooh. know, in, in parts of the the black hills you know that would be fun to that see if be. you know they're still there um but i think you find more rattlesnakes when you're trying to find those horned lizards well that sounds fun too <laughs> <laughs> yeah joel and i keep having to move them off the road so they don't get run over in wind cave national park we're gonna have uh, to we, do we, a venomous keeping episode or venomous herping episode just a venomous episode in general and how to deal with that yeah, because we we don't have a snake pole, so Joel usually uses his tripod uh, on extend on extended <laughs> mode, <laughs> and so we we stop. You know, we we see a snake, we see another car coming at us, and we stop the cars. Like, wait, wait, let us move the snake off the road, you know. And so Joel, and so they they they're tourists, and they like to take pictures of Joel moving the snake off the road with a camera tripod. <laughs> you know, this big rattler hanging off of his camera equipment <laughs> i bet it makes for so, a good picture yeah it does oh yeah uh, when we're there by ourselves and we we don't have to rush it to allow the tourists to go by on the road um joel will lay down on his belly you know a safe distance from the snake and then with his um you know his long uh, big lens and take some really good shots on you know right at the snake's level and We've got a, a number of those that we can make prints of for another level on our Patreon site. So, yeah, it's uh, we've got a lot of photographs that we've done from our 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 herping our days out there. Well, I guess if uh, anyone wants to know what happened, they can uh, check out our Patreon. Yeah, because I'm yeah. sure it'll be done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, um, 
Anything else you got? Uh, boy, I you know we could talk for hours about all 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 sorts of things, but you know. Oh, we already we have. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, time flies when you're having fun. It does. It does. I am I am very excited to do this with you, and uh, I think it's going to be some fun content and yeah. uh, very enjoyable to listen to. I hope. <laughs> yeah i yeah because i mean i could go on and on and ask questions of your life and 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 your experience with the critters that you're used to and and wait till we get guests on that uh you know it's uh, can, can we ask each other questions while we have our guests on for questions <laughs> oh, <well, that's laughs> yeah because yeah. um yeah, I, I think that you know I see that on some of the podcasts where they all, they all start getting excited on one topic and and you know, oh, yeah. and so you know it's um, the best. they're all asking each other's question you know yeah, yeah. questions once they get in on something that they just all want to know about. <laughs> the best podcasts are scheduled to be an hour and a half long and end up being three and a half hours long. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's my personal opinion anyway you get to some real meat and potatoes when you get three hours into a podcast <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah well i i know one one thing on on our our podcast you know we we talk and listen and and uh i think on the youtube we could add some of the video of our our herping trips that um, people can actually see us doing the the discoveries and the rescues in the field you know we can um, add that, you know, to our repertoire. Yeah, that'll be super fun too. So in closing, folks, you know, we're going to really want to include you a lot too, and and uh, we'll have um, you know, love to answer your questions um, on our live feed, and which we plan to set up too, and and uh, so there'll be a, a lot of interaction that we can all learn from one another, and and uh, organize. A lot of things for our wild reptile um, outings and and uh, all that we can do with our wonderful hobby. Awesome. Um, if you want to reach out to the show, feel free at uh, herptalkradio at gmail.com. We should have a, uh, a Facebook and a Instagram. If it's not up yet, it's, it's on its way. Uh, and yeah. Well, yeah, you got any? And you got any last words? <laughs> I I don't think so right now. But I'm I'm just uh, looking forward to meeting a lot of people out there and and having fun with this wonderful herp world. Me too. I am excited to uh, meet the people. That's that's what makes herpticulture in a way. It's a small community of people. So. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, uh, we'll say good night then, or good day, or whenever you're listening to this, folks out there, and and uh, you'll be hearing from us shortly. And uh, do we have a guest already lined up? Yeah, we do, but I, I don't know if I want to talk about next week. At this point, you could tune in next week at uh, on Wednesday at five. That's uh, that's when we'll be here. Excellent. So we'll see you all then. <laughs>